Hello everyone. Today I'm going to present our longitudinal study with first episode of psychosis patients. All right, we can go next. So first of all, let's start with some general background on the topic. And so the dysfunction of the hippocampus is quite well established in schizophrenia and can also be considered as a biomarker for psychosis. But at the moment, it remains uncertain when these structural changes occur in the brain. However, research conducted in individuals at high risk for developing psychosis has revealed significant brain abnormalities compared to controls, showing the presence of these brain changes quite before the first episode. And so in this figure, we can see that when first episode psychosis patients are compared to control, there's quite a difference in left and right hippocampal volume with patients showing a reduced volume. In addition, a hemispheric effect seems to exist, uh, reporting a more pronounced decrease in the left hippocampal volume, but has been, this quite has been uh, well it documented in several studies. So we could go next. And so the presence, like uh, despite the presence of many other symptoms, such as positive symptoms, for example, uh, hallucination and negative symptoms, such as flat effect, cognitive difficulties have a considerable impact on daily functioning and nearly 70% of patients with schizophrenia have cognitive deficits. And so in addition, the structure of the hip and gap is, is quite highly related to cognition, particularly to verbal memory, which is significantly impaired in psychosis and represents an important predictor of the functional outcome of the patient. And so it, currently it is assumed that structural abnormalities in the brain are involved in the onstative dysfunctions, perhaps maybe as a result of genetic and postnatal risk factors that affect brain development afterwards. And so as a, as a result, uh, changes occur at different stages of the disease, which also support the neurodevelopmental aspect of psychosis and the need to study its progression over a long period of time. And so, of course, given what we know, this raises the question, why study first episode patients, right? And so studying first episode patients is actually quite important for understanding the structural changes that occur in the brain and schizophrenia or psychosis because it is still possible at this stage to study um, patients who have never taken antipsychotics or have had a very little exposure to them, which allows us to exclude the possibility that their medication alters the structure of the brain and therefore the cognitive function. And so we can see in this figure that there's actually a difference in the volume of the hippocampus in subfields before and after acute antipsychotic treatment in schizophrenia patients. Okay, we can go next. And so, of course, we know that antipsychotics help reduce the positive symptoms of psychosis, but they only have a limited impact on cognitive deficits. And they have been associated with structural abnormalities in the brain. And so in this figure, we can see that Yang and colleagues found a significant negative correlation between antipsychotic dosage and a hippocampal volume. And so, given that antipsychotics are not as effective in treating cognitive deficits as they are in treating positive symptoms, the research suggests that the anticholinergic burden of antipsychotics, which is the overall effect of medication that have anticholinergic burden uh, and sedative properties, and so should be considered because it is or may be associated with verbal memory deficits, which are the most consistently reported deficits in patient with that. In addition, uh, this recent cross-sectional study by Ballesteros and colleagues found that deficits in verbal memory and speed of processing were associated with a high dopaminergic burden, uh, basically meaning that increased dosage of antipsychotic medication was associated with increased cognitive deficits, maybe perhaps suggesting overtreatment of a patient in the early stages of the disease. And so knowing all this, we basically aim to examine, okay, what are the changes in verbal memory performance and also in the hippocampal volumes in patients uh, compared to control over time? And so we wanted to determine to the extent to which maybe antipsychotic treatment may explain some of the changes over time uh, within patients. And so uh, we can go next. We hypothesize at first that, of course, 
patient would have a poor verbal memory performance and reduce hippocampal self field volume over time when compared to control. Uh, but also, just within patient regarding medication, we expected that dopaminergic burden would be negatively associated with subfields, especially with denser dopaminergic receptors. And we also expected anticholinergic burden to be negatively associated with cognition, particularly to verbal memory performance uh, in patient with first step of psychosis. So we could go next. Okay, so now we're, we're going through a bit of the methodology. We can go next slide two. And so um, to answer our research question, we examined FEP patient uh, who were also followed by the PEP Montreal Clinic, but we also followed non-clinical control who all completed a 3T MRI and a neurocognitive test. Um, Cox State, for those who knows, and at three, nine, 12, and 18 months after admission. So we had four time points uh, collecting data. But also at a baseline, we collected antipsychotic dosage, which was measured using the clartramazine equivalent doses. And the anticholinergic burden was calculated using the drug burden index, also known as DBI. And so for antipsychotic dosage, also known as dopaminergic burden, it was measured with clorpromazine equivalent doses. And so this is a measure of equivalence between antipsychotic medication, making it possible to compare their dose, but also effect on dopamine receptors. Um, it is also known as a dose of the medication in question that is equivalent to 100 milligram of clorpromazine. And for the anticholinergic burden of antipsychotics, we use the DBI. And so it's a measure to quantify exposure to medication with anticholinergic or sedative properties. And so when the score is greater than one, exposure to anticholinergic effect is considered as high. And so, I mean, the main effects of anticholinergic medication include dry mouth, but also delirium, confusion, and memory differences, especially in, oral, in older individuals. And uh, finally, the DBI score was provided using the anticholinergic burden calculator. And so now we're going to go through uh, the results. And so consistent with our hypothesis, the generalized estimating equation analysis revealed a reduced hippocampal volume in patient when compared to control over time. But also uh, our results suggested that a poor verbal memory performance was found in patient when compared to control over time. So we can go next uh, for FAP patients only. We found four significant negative correlation between medication and subfill volumes. And so correlation between dopaminergic burden and change from uh, the three to 18 month follow up in volumes for the left A1, left A4 dentogyrus, left fembria and left hippocampus. And we can go next. And finally, we also found a significant negative correlation between the anticholinergic burden of antipsychotic and change from three to, uh, three to 12 months of follow-up in verbal memory performance. And so, uh, basically, results from our study suggest, uh, we, can, we can go to the next slide. And so, yeah, the study suggests a significant redu reduced hippocampal volume, but also an impaired verbal memory performance in patients over time when they are compared to healthy control. But they also suggest a significant association between antipsychotic dosage and volumes, but also anticholinergic burden and cognition mainly found in the verbal memory performance. And so we can say that despite the effectiveness of antipsychotics in re uh, relieving psychotic symptoms, it appears that over the long term and at high doses, they may have a detrimental effect on cognitive performance and might not necessarily prevent the progressive brain changes that occur with the disease. And so, of course, larger neuroimaging studies with a longer follow-up period may be useful in understanding the long-term effect of antipsychotics on brain, but also a greater clinical consideration of the anticholinergic burden of antipsychotics should be addressed in psychiatric patients uh, in order to reduce cognitive deficits that mainly impact patient function and quality of life. 
And so we can go to the next slide. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, my supervisor, Dr. Martin Lepage, Cathy, Delphine, and Karim for helping me and assisting me during this project as the entire CRISP lab team. And thanks for listening. Hello, everybody. And I'm happy to be here to present my research on gut-brain connection in a mouse model of ALS-FTD, understanding how gut bacteria could change our understanding of brain diseases. Now, before I start, I want to start by asking you to take a second and think about one activity you did this morning. Maybe walking out of bed, brushing your teeth, breathing. In each of these activities, you used a variety of muscles essential um, to carry out your activities. And this is why neuromuscular degenerative disorders are so devastating. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, in short, is one such example. Uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis destroys nerve cells, which can no longer innervate muscles and co essentially causes the muscles to die and degenerate. And typically, ALS patients die within three to five years from onset due to respiratory failure. Now, even more devastatingly, about 50% of ALS patients also develop cognitive symptoms, and about 15% of all ALS patients develop cognitive symptoms that are severe enough to be diagnosed as frontotemporal dementia, which is a disorder that affects the frontal and temporal lobe of the brain and cause memory behavior and or speech dysfunction. Um, so essentially, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and frontotemporal dementia lie in a spectrum of diseases with pathological and clinical overlap. Unfortunately, the few existing treatments for these illnesses are largely symptomatic and to date, no cure exists. We need to find better options. Fortunately, our understanding of brain diseases is evolving. The recognition that the brain is intimately connected to the rest of our body is opening up new avenues of research. The gut microbiota, which basically means the microbes that live inside our gut, can modulate under our brain function through numerous ways, such as production of neurotransmitters and gut hormones. And an imbalance of the different bacteria in our gut has been implicated in several different neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. However, these findings are still much in infancy, and we have relatively little knowledge about the role of gut microbiota in ALS-FTD. Now, our current understanding of the gut microbiota is that the gut microbiota is affected by a whole cohort of factors. Um, such include the effect of genes, the environment, so diet and toxin exposure, and also um, sex differences. And to briefly go over, um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is known to be um, significantly affected by sex differences in which men um, are two to three times more susceptible and also develop the disease earlier than women. Now to go on to um, the objective of the study, um, I want to examine the role of gut microbiota in, in the um, in a ALS FTD mouse model. And I wanna essentially look at um, the gut microbiota composition and gut brain axis dysfunction. And in order to do this, I'm utilizing a method called uh, gut bacteria sequencing or 16RS sequencing, which is one of the golden standards to look at um, the microbiota composition. So I start off by collecting fecal samples from these mice, and then I go on to extract the genome. I um, Then they're sequenced, and ultimately I get some readouts and some of the different readouts that I examine include diversity of microbes, essentially how diverse and um, is there abundance of uh, a variety of microbes. 
and also composition. So looking at which species um, exist and how much abundance are there perhaps um, some pathologic or beneficial microbes that dominate the gut microbe population um, versus other ones. And one of the first findings that I found um, in these mice is that they express a very striking sexual dimorphism in terms of survival. So when you look at the survival curve, you can see that in red, the female mice on average live um, significantly longer than male mice. And so we look to examine also the, um, the role that, or the expression that um, the mutant uh, pathological protein um, in these uh, transgenic mice. And to do that, I looked at uh, different tissue life sites. So that included brain, spinal cord, and the gut. And what was striking to find was that um, we found the expression of these toxic pathological protein in both spinal cord, uh, brain, and gut. But this expression was very, um, very distinct in the gut, where we found the expression only in the ileum and cecum section. And on the right, you can see um, these are pertaining to the latter part of the small intestine, and also um, the cecum pertains to um, what's commonly called as the poop sac. And now moving on to looking at some of the results we found in terms of actual microbial uh, alterations, when we compared um, the wild type versus transgenic mice, we found something very interesting. So for this result, um, the objects that are closer together are similar in terms of microbiota composition than objects that are further away. Um, and then each point represents one sample for animal, colored and shaped to respective group. And so um, we're looking at the green colored wild type um, compared to the red colored transgenic mice. And what you see is in the post onset um, result, we see this shift in um, microbial composition in the transgenic mice, in which we see kind of um, this cohesion of red points in the middle. And when we analyzed this statistically, we found that indeed um, there was statistical difference in the microbial composition between the transgenic mice and the wild type mice. And when we further broke this down to looking at the exact composition differences, we found that um, we found that the so the yellow left bars represent enrichment of certain microbes in the wall type mice versus the blue right bars represent enrichment in the transgenic mice. And we found that wall type had significantly more um, of the genus lactobacillus, which is a beneficial bacteria that produces butyrate, a metabolite that essentially provides energy for the gut cells. And furthermore, when we compared female to male mice, um, we also saw something very interesting in which we saw decrease of beneficial microbes um, in TDP or transgenic male mice. So here now we see left uh, brown bars representing enrichment of certain microbes in the TDP43 female mice, and we see enrichment of um, Lactobacillus and also um, Acromensia species. So now here, Acromensia species is a beneficial bacteria species with anti-inflammatory effects. And essentially, um, we think that we, we think that these um, reduction of beneficial bacteria are contributing um, to the exacerbated disease in male mice compared to female. Now to put all the results together, um, we found that the pathological protein expression is found in the gut, which may be driving the gut dysbiosis. Um, and we saw that gut microbiota changes precedes um, motor 
weakness onset in the transgenic mice um, with decreased beneficial microbes. Um, and we see that shift in gut microbiota parallel sex dependent disease progression in TDP43 mice. And we think that um, these results suggest that gut microbiota changes or indeed um, contributing to neurodegeneration and CNS function. And um, in the future, we'll be looking at um, manipulating the gut microbiota composition in order to actually see how does this affect the disease outcome and survival. Thank you very much.